What I noticed over time was I was talking to women in these archetypes, these stories. And when I would talk to women in these storylines, I would just see light bulbs like, oh my God, that is me. And, and they could connect to it. Hello, everyone. I'm Wendy Myers of MyersDetox.com. Welcome to the Myers Detox podcast. Today, we have a great show on the truth about hormones. Uh, my friend, Dr. Sean Tasson is a OBGYN. Uh, he's a brilliant doctor that talks about, you know, integrative medicine, functional medicine, bioenergetics, and a diet and lifestyle to address your hormones. We talk about, you know, about the birth control pill, about hormone replacement. We talk about uh, testosterone being the number one deficiency uh, when it comes to hormones. We talk about toxins and how they affect your hormones. We talk about a lot of different issues uh, when it comes to hormones and hormone balancing and essentially the truth about hormones. You got to listen up. There's a really, really good show if you're concerned about hormones or having trouble balancing your hormones. And I know you guys listening are concerned about your heavy metal load, your toxin load, and how that can impact your hormones. The research does show that heavy metals have a, and chemicals and pesticides have a dramatic impact on your hormone levels. Dr. Shantason talks about how xenoestrogens or fake estrogens are five to 10 times stronger and act on your hormone receptors five to 10 times more than natural estrogen. So it's a real problem in our environment today and leads to fertility issues and, and so on. And some of these symptoms related to hormone imbalance. But if you want to take my quiz, it's at heavymetalsquiz.com. This quiz will tell you your relative level of body burden of toxins and what to do about them. You get a free video series after you take the quiz. So just go to heavymetalsquiz.com and you'll get all your frequently asked questions answered when it comes to heavy metal and chemical detox. Our guest today, Dr. Sean Tassone, he's an MD and a PhD, and he's known as America's holistic gynecologist. And he's the first physician in the US to be double board certified in obstetrics and gynecology and by the American Board of Integrative Medicine. And in addition to holding a medical degree, uh, he has a PhD in mind body medicine, and he's a practicing OBGYN in Austin, Texas. He's a hormone specialist, an author, a speaker, highly rated patient advocate and a creator of the world's first integrative hormonal mapping system. And in his 20 plus years of practice, Dr. Tassone has seen over 40,000 women, and he's determined to remove the myths surrounding women's health. And as an integrative health practitioner, he believes that you should have an active role in your own care, not leaving it just up to your physician. And his work includes studies and publications on hormone imbalances, spirituality and medical care and whole foods to heal the human body in addition to integrative medicine. Dr. Tesson is uh, featured in many publications, including the New York Times, NBC News Online, and in his book, uh, The Hormone Balance Bible, published by HarperCollins, is now available for purchase. You can learn more about Dr. Tesson and his work at tessonmd.com. Sean, thank you so much for joining the show. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited. So why are you so passionate about helping women with their hormones? You know, it's an interesting question. It's a legitimate question, obviously. Be being a male, I obviously get that a lot. And what I like to fall back on is I think the reason that I am where I am today is about 20 years ago, my mom was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. I was already uh, a re an OBG resident at that time. I was like in my second year, but I was kind of in that mold still of, you know, um, it's embarrassing to say it, but we used to say you heal with steel. That's a surgeon kind of mentality. And when my mom got sick, I knew it was bad. Ovarian cancer is never good. But what I found was five years later when she passed away and I'm the only child, I kind of got caught up in that whirlwind of being not just the son, but a physician. But I found that as the physician, I couldn't, I couldn't help her. I couldn't do anything to not just help her survive, but to lead a good life, you know, to, to be um, happy and to be, um, you know, to help with the aches and pains. And, and, and so when she passed away, I was like, you know, I kind of felt 
a little bit worthless as a doctor. I was like, you know, I couldn't even do anything to help my own mom. What am I going to do for somebody else's mom? And so I kind of just started this little journey of my own where I did a two-year fellowship with Andrew Weil at the University of Arizona. And, and then I did a five-year PhD where I, I basically just toured around the South America and hung out with indigenous shamans and learned kind of just different ways of healing. And I think the culmination of all that was more of a personal journey. Like I didn't know that I was going to be a using it in my practice. But I think over time, uh, it just kind of morphed into how I do things. And I, I do still do surgery, like I do robotic surgery. But I also can tell somebody to use yarrow flower for heavy periods, you know, or to talk like we were talking earlier about NES health and, and refer patients for energetic evaluations and stuff like that. Fantastic. And so, so you, you focus on hormones. So what are the top hormonal imbalances that women suffer from that you deal with? Far away, no question across the age spectrum, testosterone deficiency is number one. I used to think that it was going to be estrogen dominance because of obesity and, you know, xenos in the food and things like that. But the reality is testosterone deficiency from birth control pills all the way up through menopause is a massive plague of the 21st century for women. And it really isn't talked about a lot. And, and if it is talked about, the doctors that are doing it are making gobs of money putting in pellets, which I'm not a huge fan of. I think there, there's better ways to do things. But those two, estrogen dominance, testosterone deficiency, and then the other one I'm seeing a lot now is subclinical hypothyroidism. And so what are the, the number one things that you feel are contributing to these hormone deficiencies and hormone imbalances? What are, what's the underlying root cause? Well, first of all, uh, definitely other medications from uh, birth control pills being one of the biggies to, you know, things like blood pressure meds, weight loss drugs, um, antidepressants and things like that. Uh, second uh, is going to be just diet. I think our diet, you know, as we all know, uh, you live in a place where there's probably a lot of great food, but, um, and we all do, but we, it's cheaper to eat bad than a lot of times. And the obesity rates go up and up and up that throws the hormone levels off uh, throws thyroid off. I think the amount of inflammation that's in the body, you know, inflammation is a word that we throw around a lot, but inflammation coming from even things like gluten and bread and things like that can definitely be adding to it. And, and what about toxins? So yeah, the, you know, there's a lot of the endocrine disrupting agents, whether it's pesticides or possible xenoestrogens in the food supply or in the water that we're surrounded by plastic all the time, you know, leaving those water bottles in your car and they get hot. I just think it's, it's, we're, we're, I can't remember the number of toxins in a person's body. It's well over 150 uh, at, at any given time in different quantities. But um, even the, you know, from the food we eat, like certain fishes, they're just not clean. And um, I don't even know if fishes is a word. Sorry about that. Fish, um, <laughs> the, the plural of being fish, um, that uh, it's just, it's rampant in our, in our country. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I fully believe that, you know, the a big cause of hormone issues are, you know, metalloestrogen, hormone disrupting mm -hmm. chemicals and pesticides, uh, such a huge problem. So, so how does your approach to health and hormones differ from, you know, other physicians in your field? I just saw a lady just a minute ago who, um, she was told her hormones were normal uh, but the reality is normal. I kind of like, like a normal as to you're either in the house or you're not in the house. The question then is, where are you in the house? And what I like to do is you could be, especially like say testosterone, you can be in the house, but you could be laying on the floor in the basement, which may not be for you. It may not feel particularly good. So that can just by getting you up into the middle of normal could be a lot better. So I tend to look at things, not just normal, abnormal, but then where are you in the normal 
the normal range. And also looking at things like estradiol and progesterone as a balance and making sure that, you know, the amount of estrogen that you have for progesterone is, is kind of in an area where I find most women to be most comfortable. So what's the difference between integrative and traditional medicine? And so, uh, you know, a lot of women go to conventional doctors and they'll put them on the, the birth control pill or hormone replacement just automatically if they have low hormones. What is it that you do differently? So integrative is more, so we've got, you know, the names now, integrative, functional, lifestyle, all these things. Integrative medicine to me means that I have just learned a lot, a little about a lot of different treatment modalities. So I know some about chiropractic. I know some acupuncture. I know, I know just enough to make referrals. So what I've tended to do over the last 20 years is um, what would be ideal in an integrative practice would be like on Fridays to have a sit down table where you have a homeopath, a naturopath, a, an MD chiropractor, and you, you put this patient out and everybody gives you a little tidbit of what they would contribute to her care. And then you give that to the patient and let her decide what pieces she wants to put in place. So, because obviously I can't do that. What I've done is I just have to know enough to say, yeah, I think this might uh, like for pelvic pain or something, you might benefit from some chiropractic or um, some acupuncture. And so I have built a network of providers that I trust that um, I would refer to. And so I kind of am kind of like the quarterback and, and seeing if she can, if I can get her to the right places. And then in kind, those providers will also refer to me if they think she needs hormones versus say functional, which is more, you know, doing different types of testing and then interpreting the test, which I do a little bit of that too. But, um, but I would say I'm more of an integrative based practitioner. Okay, great. Yeah. And so what are the, the ways that you approach hormones? So when a, a patient's coming to you, how do you uh, try to balance or improve their hormone levels? So I look at hormones as being kind of a six step process and only for one of those steps, do you actually need a physician? The other five are self-care. So I look at things from through the lens of a spiritual practice, whether that's journaling to praying, whatever it is you, and, and I have different things in the book that I wrote for different imbalances. Hormonal modulation is the one step you would actually need a physician for. Uh, the third thing being what, what I call infaceuticals in my book, which you are way more familiar with than I am, where the energetic aspect of, of medicine and, and unblocking blockages and, and, but, but for some, for, for Harry and NES, that that's the, the drops of water, energetic integrators and things like that, which I barely touch in the book because it's obviously such a huge topic, but for some people, sometimes, you know, Reiki or healing touch or, you know, acupuncture and energetic, uh, essential oils and things like that. Nutrition is obviously a huge piece of hormone imbalance. If I had to pick one thing that I would feel would be at the bottom of that pyramid for hormone balance, it would be uh, definitely uh, nutrition and exercise and then proper supplementation. So you can choose a, a cadre of those pieces. You can choose one thing at a time, but it really gives more, it gives women more options. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, the bioenergetic aspect is amazing. Cause I, you know, I addressed my hormones using this health also, mm -hmm. and I found it to be incredibly effective. It really helped to control hot flashes I was having and, and, and other uncomfortable symptoms of, of menopause for sure. Yeah. And so you came up with a hormonal mapping quiz. And so how did you come up with your 12 archetypes that are in the, the hormonal mapping quiz? What I noticed was over the last 20 years, I'm I, I jokingly say I'm kind of a blue collar practitioner. I'm just, I'm a pretty simple person. I try to keep things as simple as possible. And what I noticed was if I was talking to women about certain hormones, like, oh, your testosterone's low. And it wasn't as connecting as if I started telling them the stories of the other women that I've heard. So what I noticed was these consistent storylines coming through with women that had low thyroid or high thyroid or low estrogen, high estrogen. And I started to just kind of put those together. And what I noticed over time was I was talking to women in these archetypes, these stories, 
And um, what I noticed was I was I had about 12 of them. Some were way more common than others. And I started when I would talk to women in the storylines, I would just see light bulbs like, oh, my God, that is me. And, and they could connect to it versus me just saying, oh, it sounds like you have low testosterone. They could they could connect with it, but the story just made it that much more special. And so the quiz what I did was I came up, everybody's got a quiz. Everybody's got a five or 10 question quiz. And mine's about 36 questions. And the thing that's different about it is it's a graded response. So um, not like me, sounds like me totally, you know. And then on the back end, it's also weighted in the sense that if you have insomnia, I have a higher weighted scale in the progesterone archetype. So it's very mathematical on the back end. I majored in math in college, so I'm kind of a nerd. And I really spent a lot of time on this algorithm. So when you get the quiz results, it's it's not that you didn't necessarily score in some other archetypes as well, but you're getting the one that had the highest number based on your answers. Okay, great, great. And so also a lot of women need, you mentioned testosterone replacement. A lot of women have low testosterone, especially as they get older. So can testosterone potentially save a woman's life? Is that recommended? Is it something that you recommend often and what type? I always say hormones in general, the only two hormones you need to necessarily survive are cortisol and thyroid. The others, you don't need them to necessarily live, but you need them to live well. And testosterone for a woman is hardly ever talked about, but it's responsible for muscle mass, bone density. If it's uh, super low along with estrogen can really contribute to osteoporosis. And uh, testosterone for a woman is also hair growth. It's uh, it, it's a feel good hormone. I often say low testosterone. If it was a t-shirt would just say meh. Like, you know, you just don't care, you know, I can do it, but I don't really care, you know? And so, but who wants to live that way? So, and I always have women ask me too, like, they'll feel better. I just had a lady said she hasn't felt this good in seven years. And, and she, she's like, well, how long can I be on the hormones? And my answer was, well, how long do you want to feel good? You know I mean? It's, it's women feel like they shouldn't feel good. And that's what I find fascinating in, in being a, a GYN is that I do feel like there's this undercurrent in our society that women should, it's okay for women to suffer men, not so much, but women, they can suffer a little bit, you know, and, and it's just, and, and it's like, like I said, how long do I want, how long do you want to feel better? If you want to feel better, then let's feel better. And, and it's okay. And I often try to get women away from this aspect that while they are medications, they're just hormones that you've normally had in your body. They're being a bioidentical. They look very similar. The um, exact is your body's natural hormones. So if you think about it, it's not like you're taking Motrin every day for the rest of your life. You're taking a hormone that, that has positive benefits to your body as well. And so what about the other hormones? Like, you know, so many women have this conundrum where they have low estrogen production in their body, but they have estrogen dominance because of all the xenoestrogens and the chemicals and pesticides that are entering their bodies. What, what is going on there and how does that affect their labs? Well, the thing with xenoestrogens is if we talk about a lock and key, xenoestrogen is close enough to the estrogen to stimulate the receptor in your body. The problem is, is most times they hit the, they hit that receptor five to 10 times harder than your natural estrogen. So the xenoestrogens a little can be a lot. And over time you can stimulate. And, and what happened was you know, 20 years ago when we were giving women Premarin, which is a xenoestrogen, it's horse urine, we were noticing when we combined that with progestin, which is a fake progesterone, we did have an increase in breast cancer rates. But we're talking about two medications that aren't natural to your body. And what we found was that we don't have that same aspect when we use natural estrogen and progesterone that we've seen so far. They've followed women for the last seven years and they haven't seen that increase. So um, you have to just remember that, yeah, if you're taking a, a xenoestrogen, 
or xenoprogesterone, you're stimulating those receptors and that breast tissue and that uterine tissue so much harder. Yeah. And so what about when it comes to people's labs, women's labs? So uh, many women will be estrogen dominant because of xenoestrogens and then have low estrogen levels on their labs. Can you talk a little bit about that? So the, the problem with labs is that they usually will order, they'll, they'll only usually check estradiol, estrone, and estriol, the three estrogens. So you could have xenoestrogens that don't even get picked up on a blood or urine test because we're not necessarily testing for those urine or for those estrogens. You have to test for, you know, ethanol, estradiol, or whatever that, that xeno is that you're, that you're taking um, or that you're consuming. So you have to be a little bit careful. So you also have to, the point being is you don't just look at labs, you also look at symptoms. And some women will actually have estrogen dominance, even when they have a normal estrogen level, but not because their estrogen is too high. It's because their progesterone is too low. So you can have a combination where you have your estrogen could be too high and you have low progesterone, which is even worse, but sometimes even just having a normal estrogen, if your progesterone isn't rising to offset the effects of the estrogen, every two weeks out of every month. So a lot of women have had a hysterectomy. Uh, they're on bioidentical estrogen and they're not on any progesterone that could put them into an estrogen dominant state uh, just because they're not, they don't have the benefit of the progesterone. Yeah. And so let's also talk about, you know, like when women get labs, they do their labs with uh, their typical conventional medical doctor and they're told that their labs are normal, but they're struggling day to day. What's the next step? What should they do? So it's really frustrating. You know you better than anybody else. So I always say normal isn't always normal in the sense that, that maybe it's not your normal. The way that they find normals on labs, let's say it's a free testosterone. Free testosterone is 0.1 to 6.4. That's normal. What they do to get those ranges is they'll say 10,000 women came in who didn't have any complaints and we drew their blood and these 10,000 women came in this range, we took out the top 5%, we took out the lot bottom 5%, and this is what normal is. Now, that's not to say that 200 of those women weren't having fatigue, but they weren't asked the right questions, or they, they didn't know that that fatigue was related to their testosterone. So they don't really look at the symptoms at the same time. So what happens is you'll be told like, oh yeah, your, your, your testosterone is normal or your thyroid is normal. Well, with thyroid, they could just be checking a TSH, which really is a horrible indicator of your thyroid health. You really need to look at the actual thyroid hormones. I can't tell you how many women I check will come in with a free testosterone of one. Now I could multiply that six fold and it would still be normal, but it, you might feel like a totally different person, even having it go up two points. So it's, it's one of those things, small changes sometimes in hormones can make massive shifts in the way people, women feel. Um, we think of men's testosterone and, you know, you're talking about these big wampum injections once a week. And, and that's because guys have testosterone levels that are, you know, 10 to 20 times higher. And then women in most cases, sometimes more. And so they need more dosing, but sometimes just little fluctuations can help immensely. And so what about the birth control pill? Because a lot of doctors prescribe the birth control pill to kind of even out the hormones. Is that a, a magic cure-all and why or why not? Well, so I'm kind of middle of the road when it comes to birth control pills. I think birth control pills for birth control, it's fine. That's what they're made for. Now, you just need to know what the side effects are and what the potential risks are with, with any medication. The problem that I have with birth control pills is when they're prescribed to women for problems like heavy periods, PCOS, uh, pelvic pain, endometriosis. It's not fixing anything. It's just it's taking over your ovulation and it's keeping, it's a, it's faking a pregnancy in a sense so that your body doesn't ovulate. And the problem with that is you might feel better and that's okay. If women feel better, like I've, I've got a couple of patients, they just don't want to come off of their pills because 
they're afraid of the pain that they used to have. And so if they're not having any side effects and we're looking at their electrolytes and their zinc and all their stuff, then, then I want them to be happy. So I would be more than happy to keep them on those, but I wouldn't just willy nilly put someone on them until I knew exactly what I was dealing with. Because in most cases for like, say heavy, bad periods, if we can rule out structural issues, sometimes high doses of flax or fish oil with some magnesium and some maca can, can change somebody's life too. And they don't need to be on a birth control pill. So I think that they're overprescribed and, and I think it's because it's a much longer discussion to talk to somebody about taking supplements and eating right than it is to just put them on a birth control pill. And we've gotten into that, but I think for women, if they don't want birth control, they just have, they may have to keep fishing till they find somebody that actually will dig a little bit deeper. And so you have a protocol called the shines protocol. Mm -hmm. Um, so what can women learn from that? And and can you explain that a little bit more and, and how you use that to approach women's hormones and balancing them? So that's the steps that I was talking about, spiritual practice, hormones, infaceutical, energetic information, nutrition, exercise, and supplements. And each of the 12 archetypes has a shines protocol. So it could be something like, let's take, for instance, uh, low cortisol, which I call the saboteur, because those women have sabotaged their own health because they take care of everybody else and they don't take care of themselves. And so over time, they used to be workaholics and now they're kind of burned out and they've gone into this self-sabotage phase. So let's say a spiritual practice for her might be learning how to say no because those people tend to have yes, 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 job, work, kids, whatever, Um, you know, hormonally, we might want to look at her thyroid and and testosterone and other hormones, because usually by the time cortisol hits the skids like that, it's because all the other hormones are now worn out. And this is the last one to go. The energetic aspects, you can talk about, you know, the energetic integrators. And I think nine or 10 is the ovarian hypothalamic planet pituitary axis. You can try that or acupuncture. And for nutrition, obviously, I want those women eating high fat, high protein, low processed foods. The uh, exercise, actually what's interesting, exercise for that archetype is to not exercise too hard because these women, they, they probably already gained a little bit of weight and they want to get out there and do cardio and stuff, but you, you're burning. You, you don't even have a candle left to burn. A friend of ours, um, um, who has a, and she talks about this openly on her YouTube page, Flipping 50, Debbie Atkinson. She had this issue and she works out for a living. That's what she does. And I had to tell her to stop working out and she flipped out on it. And, but, but she ended up losing weight because she slowed down. It's sometimes, you know, you just have to listen and look at the labs and then supplements, obviously for somebody like that, you know, adrenal complex with uh, maybe even some glandular cortisol in there or, and some ashwagandha, rhodiola, and some other things. So each of the archetypes, and the great thing about it is you can pick one, you can focus on one and go deep. You can try a couple. It's really up to you and how you want to do it. Okay, great. And so, and you have, you outline all this stuff in your book, the hormones balance Bible. And I love the name of that. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what someone can expect when they're reading your book and the kind of tips they can get from it? So the way the book is laid out, page 14 is a QR code. There's a quiz. You can take the quiz if you want. It's free, obviously. Uh, Or you can get your blood drawn. And that's another way. Uh, Obviously the quiz is it's not as scientific as actually having labs, but it's free and it's something you can do at midnight when you're bored. And the archetype, uh, the, the way the book is laid out, it talks about each of the hormones and what they do and then uh, how to test. So it talks about urine, saliva and, and uh, uh, blood. And then it goes into the actual archetypes. And uh, initially the archetypes uh, chapters are set up by um, symptoms, uh, a story, how you feel, um, what to expect. And then the second half of the book is the archetypes and each of them in their shines protocol. And the the thing about the book is it's about 500 pages. There's a lot of information. It's not necessarily meant to be read from front to back, although I have a lot of people do that. It's because your archetype can change 
you know, over a couple of years, you could be high in estrogen, you know, when you're 49 and low in estrogen when you're 51. And so it, it's one of those books to just keep on your shelf and, 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 you know, use it over time. You can take the quiz as many times as you want. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. And I love, 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 and totally respect that you talk about bioenergetics uh, in your book. Cause I think that's, it's really not bad. near as proficiently as you yeah. do. <laughs> uh, it's a difficult topic. I, I mean, yeah. I, it, it's a lot. Yeah. It is difficult for people to get their minds around, but I think people are definitely more open to new ways of, of approaching their health. And I, I just love it that you're kind of, uh, you know, exposing people to that maybe, you know, as a, a, a medical doctor, I think gives it a, a lot more weight to, to people that are skeptical. Uh, so I love that you're, you know, you you brought that up in your book. It's fantastic. I think the way that I look at it too, is, is, you know, it's, it's not such a, a big stretch to think, Oh, if you're stressed out, you have a headache. Yeah. Well, if you're stressed out for a long time, your estrogen, testosterone, thyroid can be thrown off too, because you don't need those hormones to live per se. So your body's going to shut your hormonal system down because it needs the energy to digest food and pump blood to your brain and all that. So hormones tend to be one of the first things to go when you're not living the life that you need to live. So um, I think we just need to make it more accessible. So you don't always have to go to the physician. You can try some things. And if you need us, we're here. Yeah. Fantastic. So tell us about uh, your website and where we can mm -hmm. learn more about you and your work. So Tasson MD, T A S S O N E M D is dot uh, com is my website. The quiz is on there. Uh, you can read more about the book on there too. Coming up in the next few months, uh, I'm going to probably have courses for women that want to do the Shines Protocol in a more kind of guided fashion. Um, I'm recording those right now, but usually it's just a place for information. I have some blog. I talk about things I like, things I don't like. Um, Instagram is huge. That's where I put a lot of my information at Sean Tesson MD. So that if you're interested in watching me dance or do TikToks, well, there you yeah. go. <laughs> I, I definitely, I'm going to sign up for that right now. <laughs> okay. I'm not uh, Anthony Yoon, but I'm getting on board. Well, Dr. Tesson, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I, so many women are having so many issues with their hormones. So thank you for shedding light on, on this topic and giving us some, you know, some answers on, you know, direction to go. And, and everyone, I'm Wendy Myers. Thanks for tuning into the Myers Detox podcast. And it's, it's my pleasure every week to help bring you experts to, you know, look at your health issues in a different way and in alternative ways so that you can, you know, address them once and for all, because you do deserve to feel good. So thanks for tuning in and I'll talk to you soon. The Myers Detox Podcast is created and hosted by Wendy Myers. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Wendy Myers and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.